Yes, thank you, Chelsea. All right, so welcome everyone. And I wanna introduce, I'm gonna pass it right over to our speaker, who is Mikkel Key. So Mikkel, she received a Bachelor of Science in both molecular and cellular biology and physiology. She earned a master's in experimental psychology and she is currently working as a PhD student in the neuroscience program here at University of Illinois, where her primary research investigates how diet and other lifestyle factors impact brain health and cognitive aging. Today, she's gonna to be talking about kind of that role of genetics and epigenetics in the relationship between nutrition and cognitive aging. Feel free to enter questions into that chat box as we go. And yeah, I'll pass it right on over. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, so as uh, Lisa mentioned, um, um, I have kind of been a little bit all over the place. Um, I got my both of my bachelor's at Louisiana State University in Shreveport, um, got my master's in experimental psychology at Indiana State University, so not that far from here, um, and currently here at UIC. Um, so my research interests um, really kind of revolve around a couple of different areas, uh, mainly nutritional cognitive neuroscience, so understanding how nutrition um, affects cognition through the lifespan. Um, um, also looking at health disparities um, and cognitive aging. Um, so in general, understanding um, the aging experience. Um, so uh, yeah, so this, this, these topics that we're gonna be talking about um, are definitely near and dear to me. Um, I have quite a few projects um, going on right now that involve these topics. So a paper that I published last year looking at um, how a dietary pattern of vitamins, minerals, and amino acids um, moderated the relationship between the uh, frontal pole and memory. Um, and then I'm currently working on some projects looking at um, individual differences in the APOE uh, gene, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, and also trying to understand how body composition, so fat mass um, percent, um, and how that plays a role in uh, what we call intrinsic connectivity um, networks, or basically how these networks um, of brain regions work together um, to affect our different cognitive states like memory and decision making. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited to get into this topic with you guys. Alrighty, so, um, so how does nutrition support brain health? Um, I'm going to kind of sum uh, these up into three main areas. Uh, the first one is going to be structure. So how does uh, nutrition um, contribute to the structure of the brain? Um, and so when we talk about structure, we're talking about neurons, right? So neuronal um, cells. Uh, the second um, is neurotransmission. So how does uh, nutrition play a role in how uh, one of the ways that the brain communicates uh, with other parts of the brain and the rest of the body. And then the third area is cognitive function. So how does nutrition support these very important functions like memory, attention, um, planning, decision making. Um, and so we're going to get into, um, into all of these and then talk a little bit about the genetics and epigenetic factors that can influence these relationships. Um, so to just to start off with, uh, one of the most um, important structures of a cell, and so like I said, in this case, we're talking about neuronal cells, is the membrane. And so cellular membranes um, not just don't just provide uh, structural integrity, but they also control what can enter and exit that cell. And so specifically for neurons, the membrane potential, so the electrical charge across this membrane is foundational in how neurons can conduct electrical signals, which you've heard of as the action potential, right? Um, and this is how um, different parts of the brain are able to communicate um, signals related to our cognitive function and the rest of the body. 
Um, so the primary role that nutrition is going to play um, in brain health is by contributing to the structure of this cellular membrane. Um, and so if you notice that the brain is, is a majority fat, right? Um, if you look at the image uh, provided here, you see um, some omega-3 um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which we call PUFAs. Um, you have some choline's in there. You also have some um, phospholipids. And so one um, dietary or some dietary sources um, of these different fatty acids uh, can come from uh, things like milk, uh, eggs, liver, salmon, even peanuts um, are some of the different sources. Um, and so this is, these are things that uh, some of these your body can make, but there are others that your um, body can't and gets from your diet. Um, and so a second um, way that uh, nutrition can play um, a role in brain uh, structure is a supporting role in protecting um, the integrity of the cellular membranes. And so uh, when I talk about integrity of these membranes, um, just throughout the normal aging process, uh, these membranes can uh, become weak um, and also can incur damage from inflammation or free radicals, even uh, from just normal metabolic processes that happen and need to happen um, in the body. And so uh, nutrients from your diet can act as um, antioxidants, um, therefore protecting uh, the membrane um, and, and securing its integrity. All right, so um, the second uh, domain that we're going to talk about and how nutrition can um, influence your brain health is contributing to neurotransmission, right? So I'm sure you guys have all heard of neurotransmitters, right? There are these molecules um, that are going to serve as the chemical signal, right? So we just talked about, um, you know, neurons have the electrical signals, right? The action potential, which is probably what um, most people uh, kind of focus on, but there's a second and just as important uh, method uh, for communication, and that's the chemical signal um, that your nervous system uses to relay these messages. And so just as, um, you know, to orient you on, on these structures that we're talking about, you can look here um, at, this, at this little cartoon. Uh, so you have what we call the presynaptic uh, neuron, which is where the neurotransmitters are going to be coming from. So they're in these little vesicles and uh, they get released into what we call the synapse, which is this um, gap that's in between the presynaptic uh, neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, right? So the neuron that's trying to send a signal and the neuron that is going to be receiving it. And so, um, and so you have these uh, neurotransmitters. There's, there's so many, and it's amazing if you think about just how many different uh, chemical signals that your body can make. And you can classify them a couple of different ways. Um, I think it's, for this talk, it's, it's uh, most helpful to talk about how they're classified by function, um, and there are three main functional neurotransmitters can, um, can uh, play a role in. And so that's an excitatory function, right? So uh, you have uh, some uh, neurotransmitters like glutamate, which are excitatory. So they're going to increase the electrical excitability of that next neuron that uh, they're released um, next to. Uh, then a second um, class is inhibitory, right? So you have some neurotransmitters whose job it is to decrease the electrical excitability of the next neuron. So you want to stop the signal. So um, the uh, that particular neuron is going to release inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters. And then you have um, neurotransmitters that are considered uh, neuromodulatory. So they're going to affect the strength or how much um, of a neurotransmitter is released, um, produced and released. Uh, again, being able to kind of fine tune what signals are being transmitted um, so that they have the effect that they need to have. Um, and the crazy thing is that some of these neurotransmitters can even act as both. Uh, they can be excitatory and inhibitory, just depending on what neurotransmitter um, receptor 
um, they are in the proximity of. All right, so, um, so where does nutrition uh, uh, come into play here? Well, there are a couple of different functions that neurotransmitters um, can um, operate in. And so um, I'm grouping them here by dietary neurotransmitters. So these are literally um, components of your diet that can act as these chemical signals um, once they get um, taken up into your brain. Um, some examples of those are like acetylcholine, I mentioned glutamate before, um, GABA, and some of the different sources that these dietary neurotransmitters come from. So if we're talking about acetylcholine, we're talking about eggplant, spinach, and strawberries are a good source of acetylcholine. Um, if you're talking about glutamate, you're talking about your intake of seafood, cheese, or mushrooms. Um, so as you can, as you can tell, the, the broader your dietary patterns are, um, you know, you're getting a lot of these uh, dietary neurotransmitters. Um, neurotransmitters can also um, be uh, produced like on site, like in the cells. And so your uh, diet helps provide some of those precursors to then make uh, the neurotransmitters that are needed um, in the brain. So um, if you take a look at the, um, at the nutrients that I've listed in the center column, most of those are amino acids, right? And so um, you're gonna get your amino acids in your diet from meat, right, seafood, um, eggs, so animal products, but you can also get them from plant products like soy, a quinoa, and buckwheat. And so the idea is that there's some type of metabolic process that has to happen for you to use the precursor to then um, get the uh, neurotransmitters that you may have heard of, like serotonin and melatonin, dopamine and um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? Um, and then there are components of your diet that just support neurotransmission or supports that synapse that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and examples of those are like calcium, magnesium, and zinc. And then um, the third area um, in which nutrition can influence brain health is cognitive function, right? Um, so cognitive function is built on like the structural integrity of your brain um, in your brain's ability to um, you know, transmit signals both electrically and chemically, right? Um, so the structural and then the signal um, cascade um, uh, that nutrition uh, supports, of course, then has to uh, support cognitive function. Uh, one of the primary roles that can do this is um, literally being involved in um, a particular cognitive domain. So um, it's research has shown that acetylcholine and glutamate um, have a heavy role in learning and memory. Um, noradrenaline and GABA, which I mentioned earlier, um, are um, often involved in attention and focus, right? Um, and you have uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that are involved in mood, motivation, and addiction. Um, and then, of course, I think you guys have all heard of melatonin, right, which is involved with your sleep cycle and so your circadian rhythm. Um, and so those are some primary ways in which um, your the this nutrition can influence uh, your cognitive function but supporting roles again kind of like what we mentioned when we talked about um, structure right these vitamins and minerals like selenium uh, and vitamin e can act as anti-inflammatory agents which then preserve brain structures and therefore preserves uh, cognitive function um, you also have nutrients like glucose, right? So glucose is one of the main um, energy uh, providing molecules that your brain uses to function. Um, magnesium, again, so we're talking about minerals and B vitamins. These can aid in energy production and support metabolism, which are all um, very important to keep the brain functioning at optimal level and therefore keeping uh, these cognitive functions intact.
So in terms of cognitive aging, right? Um, I think uh, we're all uh, kind of aware that, you know, the brain uh, does not stay pristine, right, throughout the lifespan. Um, as we age, uh, there are changes that happen to our brains that uh, not only occur at the structural, but also at the functional level, right? So we know that as we age, there's cortical thinning and a reduced volume of the brain in total, but we also know that that thinning and reduced volume is not uniform across the brain. Um, we know that um, in particular the frontal lobe um, or the frontal cortex is um, particularly susceptible to uh, these changes in aging and why um, you get some uh, diminished uh, cognitive function in brain regions that are involved in, you know, planning and decision making. Um, and so you have some functions, right, that are maintained well into aging while others may decline. So whereas you might forget where your keys are or where you may have parked your car, um, you're hard pressed to forget how much you're supposed to get back from the 20 that you give the cashier or maybe where you were when some significant um, event happened in your life. Um, so there are also age-related changes in your nutrient demands, right? So as uh, we age, uh, there's reduced uh, production and absorption of the vitamin uh, D calcium complex. So um, vitamin D and calcium work uh, closely together. And so um, with aging, you have these issues with not only not producing enough of these vitamins, but you also don't absorb them as well. Um, as you uh, did in the past. Um, and so this could lead to then some of the um, functional changes that we see in aging. Also, there's the example of age-related macular degeneration. Um, so uh, this is a, like it says, an age-related issue with um, the tissue or the neural tissue in your eye. And there's lots of research showing that supplementing with a nutrient like lutein can help um, to possibly uh, remediate some of, the, some of that damage. Um, and then as we age, uh, what we call our cholinergic system or um, the system in the brain that depends on uh, choline and acetylcholine to function. If you remember a little bit earlier, we talked about how acetylcholine is involved with learning and memory, right? Which is the plastic part, how the brain changes um, to accommodate um, uh, new things that we learn. Uh, the cholinergic system also has um, a loss of function. And so, um, you know, if we talk about neurodegeneration or if we talk about um, dementia, this loss of function is heightened um, in a more diseased state. But in normal aging, it's normal to lose a little bit of this function. Hey, Mikkel. We got a question that came in. They asked, um, when you say as we age or during aging, do you mean 40s? Do you mean 60s? Can you do better to find that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, when I say aging, I'm talking about the whole gamut of the lifespan. Like as we um, get towards you know, whatever age we're going to, you know, leave this earth. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So um, there, of course, there are stages. So um, I'm not a, I'm not a lifespan uh, developmental person, but um, in general, you know, from birth to adolescence, there's a lot of um, changes that are happening, not just in the body, but in the brain. And for the most part, that um, that change is going towards um, building up, right, um, these areas of the brain um, so that they're at their peak um, developmental stage. So I'm, I'm, I would say anything past <laughs> um, don't, I, I, I should probably look this up, but I'm going to say anything past like 30 or 40, you're, you're, you're going to go start going on the, on the opposite direction, if that, if that makes sense. Um, you're not going to be building um, brain structures and, and things like you were when you were a baby or when you were an adolescent. I hope that answered your question. No, 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 definitely not. Don't throw in the tile. 
Um, so there's, like I, like I mentioned, that's why I tried to emphasize that there are some functions, right, that decrease, but there are others that continue to increase. So we know that um, as we age, we gain experience, right? Um, and we gain um, knowledge that we don't necessarily lose. So like I said, whereas you might, you know, see some changes in your memory, you're not going to forget, you know, um, like I was talking about, you know, the change that you get from the cashier, they give you a 20, like, you know how much you're supposed to get, um, get back. Um, and there are other things that we learn um, as we um, go through life that we're not, that are going to just enhance our ability to, um, to, to live and, and function in this world. Often, um, when we look at research, and we compare younger adults and um, younger adults and older adults. Um, a lot of times, the um, the accuracy is is the same, right? It's just that maybe older adults are a little bit slower, but it doesn't mean that they don't get it right, right? Um, so yeah, so so don't throw in the towel. There's 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 a lot of awesome things that come with aging, and we're working on the things that aren't as great. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, so I, I thought we it would be nice to talk about um, dementia. Um, so we got some questions, and I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, um, offering those uh, questions from I believe the last um, session maybe that you guys attended. And so there were some questions about heritability um, in terms of Alzheimer's, and there was also. Um, um, questions related to diabetes and its connection to Alzheimer's. Um, so, um, just as a um, on the outset, when we talk about dementia, I hope you guys understand that we're talking about a very mixed bag, right? Um, it's dementia is what we would call an umbrella term, right? Uh, for a lot of different diseases or disorders that may have some commonality, uh, but can be um, very different. And so I pulled this um, image, which is, is pretty nice from um, the um, alzheimers.org uh, website. And so um, when we talk about Alzheimer's, we're only, we're talking about quite a bit of the cases when people talk about dementia, but I hope that this kind of um, illustrates that there's so many other um, um, disorders that are, that are um, related, okay? So we're gonna focus on Alzheimer's. In terms of heritability, uh, we can talk about um, Alzheimer's in, in two different ways. We can talk about the early onset Alzheimer's, which is the, um, uh, the rare, um, uh, type or form of Alzheimer's. It's a, only about 10% of these Alzheimer cases. And it's really connected to um, like a group of genes that are have gone kind of haywire, right? Um, and then there's the late onset Alzheimer's, which is what I believe people are a little bit more familiar with and is the, um, the main type um, of Alzheimer's that you that you would probably hear about or probably see. Uh, one of the main um, genes that is connected to this late onset Alzheimer's is apolipoprotein E. Um, and in particular, there's the E4 variant that confers risk of possibly developing dementia. Um, and so um, that E4, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in terms of what percentage of risk is related to this particular variant. Um, and to address the idea of um, the connection to diabetes, um, uh, to be honest, um, in the research uh, literature, um, you know, diabetes is, um, well, dementia, or sorry, Alzheimer's is often uh, thought of as like type three diabetes because the, um, the outcomes are so um, are so similar. So the idea of diabetes, right, is that you have this metabolic dysfunction um, related to insulin resistance. And um, not only do you, um, if it goes uncontrolled, not only do you get this vascular damage, so uh, damage to um, your blood, um, 
uh, blood vessels, um, but there's also um, this association with cardiovascular disease. Um, so if you think about all of the um, comorbid um, issues that come along with diabetes, those are also risk factors for developing Alzheimer's. So um, cardiovascular disease, um, this uh, metabolic dysfunction, those are also um, uh, risk factors for developing Alzheimer's later in life. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the connection between diabetes um, and Alzheimer's. They share a lot of the same risk factors. Um, so, it's, um, so it's likely that those that have diabetes are also, um, you know, could possibly develop, um, you know, cognitive dysfunction later in life, especially if it goes uncontrolled for a long period of time because that damage just builds up. Now, before you move on, um, we did have a question about are there tests for this protein, these proteins you're talking about? Oh, yes. Um, so I believe that, um, like, you know, the regular, uh, like, what is it, 23andMe um, and Ancestry.com, I, I believe they do test for this, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but just regular, can I go get this, or will my doctor, I, I'm guessing maybe that's what they're asking, like, would their doctor test them for this? Um, I highly doubt it. Um, the only way that you would probably get tested for this is if you participated in a research study. And um, to be honest, I'm not sure that they would tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I don't think there are widespread ways to try to find out, um, you know, if you have this particular, this particular variant. Um, but I, I, I might be wrong. I can definitely check into that, though. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, I've talked um, a lot about how these different nutrients, right, that we take in with our diet are related to all these great things that support structure and function and, and neurotransmission. So, you know, you might be thinking, why isn't there just a pill that can just cure dementia or cognitive decline? It seems like we have the answers, right? Um, and, and you would think, but, you know, this, this problem is, you know, just to give you a broad sense, it's just super complicated. It's just very complicated. And so I want to just take you uh, maybe through a couple of reasons why um, uh, it's complicated, right? Um, so the first one just relates to how uh, researchers are still working towards understanding um, the, me the mechanism of action for not only how nutrition um, influences the brain, but even some of these uh, diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, one thing about Alzheimer's is that there are multiple different ways to um, develop it, right? Um, you could have one risk factor. Um, research has shown that the more risk factors you kind of stack up, the higher your risk is. Um, and so there's this, um, you know, what we call like factor, uh, risk factor loading, right? Um, so because there are so many different ways or mechanisms for you to, to develop um, Alzheimer's or dementia, then it makes it really hard for there to be like a one fit all um, type of solution to cure it or to stop it. Um, so um, another, um, issue is that uh, we still need to understand uh, some of these nutrient nutrient interactions and also these nutrient drug interactions so uh, many of you I'm sorry um, I'm sure that have um, decided to take uh, supplements whether it's a multivitamin or whether um, your doctor has um, asked you to take vitamin D or or another um, or another supplement um, I'm sure you've been warned like oh well if you take this particular nutrient then you don't take um, you know this this might affect your blood pressure medication or this might affect this um, and so it's really important to understand those um, those interactions and those are definitely um, active 
um, areas of research to try to kind of parse that out. And um, a third uh, just um, aspect of this is that there's still research needed to provide like sound dietary recommendations for certain nutrients. So there are examples um, like for example, lutein, which you guys may have um, heard of, which you can find in um, pretty much any vegetable that's like orange or yellow colored. Um, you can also find them in dark leafy greens. Um, there's tons of research showing that lutein um, is a great nutrient that supports brain health and cognitive function, um, but we still don't have like a, like a dietary recommendation. Like you're not gonna see that like an FDA recommended um, di dietary intake of X amount of milligrams of lutein um, because the research just isn't quite there yet, um, even though that's something that's like in the works. Um, so I, I believe all these things combined kind of um, should give you a kind of a, a clue of why um, this issue is so, is so complex. The other part of it is that the nutrition uh, related um, information that we're getting from research um, a lot of times comes from observational studies, right? So, um, you know, as if you guys attended some of the earlier sessions where we talked about different ways in which researchers, um, you know, collect information, uh, observational studies are kind of like the um, the foundational or maybe where you would start, right? So when I say observational study, I'm saying that maybe you come into a study, um, I ask you a lot about your diet, your exercise, um, I put you in the MRI, scan your brain, and I might give you some um, some tests to look at your memory and decision making, right? Um, and then I will take that information and look to see what associations I find, right? Um, and I could then report those and say, well, I see an association between this particular nutrient and this particular, um, uh, you know, brain function. Um, but where you get the real, um, you know, confident data is from what we call interventions or randomized control trials. And those are where you are actually manipulating. You have multiple groups and you say, well, this group will have um, this type of diet, this group will have another type of diet, and we'll give them the same brain scan, we'll give them the same test, and that's how we're going to be able to, um, I think, did I, um, uh-oh. I'm sorry about that, guys, I did something. Mm -hmm. You're all right. Well, you're trying to get yourself back to where you were at. Um, we did get a question, and you may be addressing this, but can reading help in decreasing dementia? Right. So, yeah, there's lots of um, research looking at um, different um, lifestyle factors that can affect um, how our brain ages, right? And so education is definitely one of those. Um, so, uh, education is is definitely um, related to a l decreased incidence of of cognitive decline. So just staying active mentally, whether that's reading, whether that's you know doing puzzles, um, being social, even um, has been uh, related to a decreased incidence of cognitive decline. So yeah, there are lots of different things besides um, nutrition that can help um, with that. I think you'll get a talk maybe a little bit later um, looking at exercise. Um, so there are lots of, lots of things that we can modify in our lifestyle that would support healthy aging brain um, and hopefully stave off um, like a diseased one. Um, all right, so back on track. So, um, so yeah, so, um, so with that said, there need to be more intervention, more randomized control trials. Um, those that we have, um, have looked at some, um, some nutrients like dark leafy greens and omega-3 um, vitamin B uh, type of interventions. And we've seen those that have been able to um, 
not not reverse, right, or not cure dementia, but they have seen it decrease the incidence of cognitive decline um, or slow the um, or slow um, a, the progression of cognitive decline. So maybe there was someone who, um, if they were tested, it seemed like they were starting to go down. Um, you know, a path of cognitive decline, but then they intervened with either this omega-3 or this dark leafy green intervention, and then they saw that it didn't repair damage that had been done, but they didn't move along through this cognitive decline as fast as someone who didn't get those. And so those are definitely encouraging. Um, but the strongest support in the research literature is for whole diets or broad dietary patterns. Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple of those. Um, so right now, research is showing um, the um, largest support for two different um, diets, right? Um, one is the Mediterranean diet, which I'm sure many of you have already heard of. And the other one um, is the MIND diet, which is essentially a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. And I'm sure, again, you guys have heard of the DASH diet, which is where you um, kind of like reduce your sodium intake and there's some other factors along with that. Um, so of course, with just as a brief overview with the Mediterranean diet, there's a large focus on being physically active and social um, in terms of what you're actually taking in. Their focus is on fruits and vegetables, your protein coming from fish and seafood, and minimizing the amount of um, poultry, dairy, meats, and sweets. Uh, with the MIND diet, it's, it's pretty similar. The focus is on uh, consuming whole grains, berries, lots of uh, dark leafy greens and vegetables, right? Um, and again, um, you know, reducing the amount of fats that you take in. If you do take in fats, um, try to make them uh, plant-based like oil, olive oil instead, and of course, reducing your dairy and your sweets. Um, so these two dietary patterns are, um, are um, have, the, have the best research supporting them um, in terms of trying to stave off a cognitive decline in older age. Um, so, but there's more to the story, right? Um, so it's not just um, what you take in, right? It's not just your diet. There's some other factors that affect this brain nutrition relationship. Um, and that could be anywhere from your nutrient status, right? So are you, do you have the, um, the normal levels of nutrients in uh, your system? Or are you deficient in some areas? Um, this can definitely affect uh, this relationship. Um, your biological sex, and so um, when I refer to this, I'm talking more about um, phases of life that could affect um, this balance. So during pregnancy, there are lots of changes that happens um, in the body uh, during that, um, and menopause. Again, lots of changes um, like systemic changes that are happening in the body that are going to affect this brain nutrition um, relationship. Your stage of human development. Again, like we said, throughout the lifespan, your nutritional needs are going to be different. And so the relationship between brain and nutrition are going to change as well. Um, there's lots of research talking about the microbiome and how the microbiome affects this brain nutrition relationship. Um, we don't have time to talk about that in this um, talk, but if you tune in um, August 4th, there is a, um, a microbiome discussion um, that, um, that you can attend and get more information there. But that's a really interesting, really cool area that uh, it would be great if I could get in that, but you know, I have my hands in so many pots right now. <laughs> but I love reading it and when it comes across, um, you know, my email, I love looking into that kind of research. Um, and then there's epi your epigenetic and your genetic profile, which we're going to dig into um, for the rest of this talk um, that can affect this brain nutrition relationship. Alrighty, so, um, so just giving you a little intro into genetics first, because 
Um, it's possible it's been a minute since um, since you've since you've heard some of this information. So um, I apologize in advance, but you know genetics has its own vocabulary, and we're going to take it step by step um, so that we all come in and come out on the other side um, understanding what's going on. Okay, um, so we have about twenty to twenty five thousand genes that are divided up between about 23 pairs of chromosomes and um, and so if you look at the image that I have in the bottom right hand corner um, it's an illustration of what we call the central dogma of genetics or the central dogma of molecular genetics and the idea is that you have um, DNA which contains these instructions right for um, what needs to happen in your cellular metabolism. Um, those instructions are tra um, transcribed into RNA, right, which is then translated into a protein if the gene you're talking about is a protein coding um, gene. But a lot of these genes, of these tens of thousands of genes don't code for proteins um, and they code for other uh, molecules that affect gene expression. And so um, uh, the idea is that they are kind of like housekeeping genes where they can either promote, enhance, or silence other genes um, and they can even protect um, your genetic makeup. So when these genes are super coiled into the chromosomes that you see at the top left hand corner, um, there are some repeating um, uh, sequences at the end, at each end of each of the chromosomes. And they protect the chromosome because, you know, as we age, little bits of the edges of the chromosomes kind of break off, right? Um, and these repeating sequences uh, don't code for anything. They're just there to protect so that the genes towards the center don't break off and you don't lose a significant amount of, of genetic information. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's amazingly designed to make sure that the system keeps working and keeps pumping, right? Um, so there are some main themes when we talk about um, like the intersection of genetics, nutrition, and brain health um, that I'll sum up in at least three different themes. So the first one is just looking at gene-driven dysfunction. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, APOE, uh, but there are other genes um, that we could talk about that have an influence on brain structure. Um, we can talk about nutrition and gene expression. So this is the epigenetic portion um, where you have nutrition that can modify the DNA, not the actual sequence, right? Not the actual instructions that your body holds, but the way in which that gene is expressed. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. And then there's genetic variability. So um, you know, this is where research is focused on how an individual's response to nutrient intake can vary based on multiple genetic factors. Um, and this is often the goal of uh, personalized medicine or nutrition. Um, maybe you might go to an online service um, to figure out, um, you know, how your genes are related to, you know, your you know, I don't know, your carb intake or protein intake or something like that. And the idea is that uh, there may be uh, variations in your genetics that would change how you respond to nutrient intake. And so, but here uh, we're going to focus on the first two um, in this talk. All right, so you might remember a little bit earlier when we talked about the lipid bilayer or the, um, the cellular membrane of a neuron, right? Um, and how important like choline, omega-3 fatty acids and other phospholipids are. Um, well, um, it, the APOE gene or the apolipoprotein E gene is responsible for producing apolipoE the protein, right? <laughs> that one's really simple, right? Um, and so, and this protein's job is to uh, transport other proteins um, in and out of the um, the membrane. So you can imagine that this is a really important role if it can affect how um, 
how or the amount um, of proteins that are in um, that are in the membrane. And so for this particular gene, um, you have uh, multiple variations um, that exist. And so these variations are um, what we could call a genotype. And so this, um, for this particular gene, we have three variants. Um, you have APOE E2, which is considered the normal functioning um, variant. So it's going to make a normal functioning protein. Um, we have the um, E3 variant, um, which is actually considered protective because of its association with um, anti-inflammatory pathways and making these anti-inflammatory proteins. And we have the E4 um, variant, which is the one that you have probably heard of that confers um, risk of developing um, cognitive decline or Alzheimer's later in life. Um, and so when we talk about a genotype, I put this, um, um, this uh, grid here in the bottom left-hand corner to kind of give you an idea um, of all the different combinations or genotypes that you could have um, for these three different variants. And so when we talk about risk, um, someone who has two E4 alleles um, would be considered at high risk. Um, so the idea is that they are about 10 to 15 times um, higher risk of developing um, Alzheimer's if they have this type of genotype. Um, and so um, if you have just one of the E4 alleles, um, because everybody gets two, so if you get one, um, then you would be considered moderate risk. Um, so your risk um, is about three to five times increased uh, for developing uh, Alzheimer's. And then um, just as a side note, when we talk about the protective effects of E3, if you at least have one E3, um, um, allele, then uh, you would be considered in like a protective uh, state and then you have your E2, which is just the normal functioning. Um, and so when I talk about risk, um, that is what we could consider a phenotype, right? Um, so a phenotype is basically what is the manifestation of a particular genotype. And in this case, we're talking about risk versus non-risk. So risk is going to be uh, related to having at least one of the E4 alleles and non-risk is going uh, to be having something other than one of the E4 alleles. And I hope that's straightforward. I don't see any um, questions yet. So I think we're on a, I think we're on a good path. Okay. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, so this is, so this is uh, basically the landscape of when we're talking about this APOE gene and why um, it's involved in risk of developing, um, at risk of developing um, Alzheimer's later in life. All right, so. Um, Before we move too far off that, Mikkel, I do want to have have you addressed this question while we are on the topic. Um, do you know approximately what percentage of the world's population has each type of variant? Yes, that's a great question. And yeah, I, I can definitely look that up. <laughs> I can definitely look it up. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I should look that up. I, I believe it's about 10 maybe about somewhere around like the 10% range of the population that has at least one of the E4 alleles. Um, but I can definitely look that up to, to see um, for each um, of those different um, variants. That sounds fascinating, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I thought maybe we could uh, stop for a moment um, and uh, get you guys thinking a little bit um, with this interactive question um, to just to check for understanding. So I have this little question up here. Um, so if Imani has a genotype of an E3, E4, and I put her um, at the top 
of this grid. And her husband, Hakeem, has a genotype of E4E4, okay? So if they have four children, um, so we have four boxes here, uh, what is their chance of having, you know, offspring that have two of these E4 alleles? And you guys can just put that in um, the chat. I'm seeing, I'm seeing all some pretty good, yeah. It's good. Very good, guys. All right, it's 50%. So two of those four um, children would end up inheriting this, um, this double E4 um, genotype. All right, great. See, you guys are, you guys are paying attention. It's a great audience. <laughs> um, all right, so um, moving on to um, looking at the epigenetic side of things, right? Um, so when we talk about epigenetics, we're talking about, um, you know, regulation of gene expression, right? Um, so like we mentioned before, you have your DNA, you have your genes that are, you know, um, set with a particular set of instructions, they're supposed to do a particular thing. Um, but you have this kind of side system that's also um, in play that's regulating whether that protein is made in bulk or whether it's reduced. Um, and there's also some other functions that it has. And so we're gonna talk about um, those a little bit. Uh, one way um, in which your uh, genome can be, um, or your gene expression can be modified is through DNA methylation. And so um, basically your DNA can have these molecular tags called methyl groups. And uh, the addition of these methyl groups is what we call methylation. And so methylation can modify um, um, the associated gene um, and it could lead to either repressing the gene, right? So, um, you know, preventing that gene from doing its job, um, or it could possibly enhance it. And so the action can also go in the other direction, which is called demethylation, where um, this uh, DNA tag can be removed. Um, and oftentimes uh, widespread what, it could go in either direction. So widespread demethylation or widespread methylation um, that's above and beyond the normal profile uh, could lead to diseases um, such as cancer. Um, but um, DNA methylation is normally, you know, a good thing. Um, and you can have methyl donors in your diet, right? So um, there are bioactive phytochemicals, uh, zinc and selenium, uh, just to name a few. And some of the sources um, from your diet that these can come from um, include like red meat, seafood, um, beans, eggs, and other dairy products. Um, another method for um, regulating gene expression is through histone modification. Um, so I have this um, image right over here to the to the left um, that you know shows you um, a chromosome, right? Which is this super hypercoiled um, DNA that's packaged up to protect it until it's ready to be read, right? Until it's ready um, for um, a gene. Uh, to produce a particular protein. And once that happens, it starts to unfold, right? And so you have this chromatin fiber that's, you know, a loosened up chromosome. Um, and then you have molecules that come in and um, try to unwind the DNA so that the gene is, can be accessed by um, transcription factors. And so um, part of this um, complex that helps to, um, you know, wind up your DNA are called histones. And so these histones um, can also have tags on them and they can be modified because the idea is your um, body can control when genes um, produce a protein when they don't. And so, um, 
you can tell it to, hey, we need to wind you back up, we're not ready, um, or it can tell it to, hey, let's unwind you so that we can pump some of these proteins out, right? Um, and so you can um, modify this histone or kind of um, um, influence um, how a gene is expressed through methylation. Um, so um, adding a methyl group. There's also what we call phosphorylation. So adding um, phosphates or acetylation as adding um, acetyl groups. Um, and again, like I said, this can either activate or inactivate transcription. Um, it can affect how a chromosome is packaged. Um, and it can also help to, um, you know, initiate um, repair. So it's involved in these um, kind of molecular processes of um, maintaining your DNA uh, so that it lasts uh, through the lifetime. Um, and so some sources of um, like butyrate or these organosulfur compounds, which often act um, as histone modifiers, can come from vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, um, also garlic, leeks, and onions. Um, so, um, so that's that's one uh, the second way in which you can get some gene uh, regulation there. And then the third one is these are so the third one is um, the non-coding uh, small. Uh, small non-coding RNA. Um, so if you remember, we talked about these molecules a little bit earlier because we said that not all genes produce are, are made to produce like a protein. Um, some of these are just going to produce RNAs that then go out and have other jobs. And you have associated nutrients like zinc, vitamin D, and selenium that help um, in the role of small non-coding non RNAs doing that job. Um, and some sources um, for, um, for these are, again, like red meat, poultry, oysters, seafood, and also certif uh, sorry, not certified, sorry, <laughs> fortified cereals um, and beans and nuts. All right, so, um, along here. Um, so I have um, this image that uh, hopefully uh, kind of ex will help to solidify um, um, the actual effects of these epigenetic changes, right? Um, so we know that as we age, there are these predictable changes in the epigenome associated with aging. And so uh, research has shown that nutrition uh, can change the epigenetic profile in three ways demonstrated with this image. So you have, um, you know, so as you age, your epigenome changes and nutrition can come in to either stop the changes that occur with aging. Um, they can actually help to reverse some of these epigenetic changes that occur with aging, or they can com um, create completely new epigenetic profiles that serve as um, a protective, like serve in a protective nature, um, and they are unlike the, um, the aging epigenome and help to maintain um, uh, function of uh, your DNA and other metabolic processes. Um, so one of the real world consequences of, um, for example, DNA methylation is related to learning and memory. And so um, as we age, there's this, um, you know, genome wide a decline in DNA um, methylation that occurs in the brain. Um, and so, um, and it's thought that this is related to learning and memory. So um, there are a couple of things. So like the consolidation of memories into long-term um, memory in the hippocampus can be triggered by altered gene expression related to epigenetics. Um, there's also, um, uh, this gene expression can also be uh, accomplished with histone acetylation. So again, we talked about the histone modification being uh, one of those epigenetic effects. Um, and then um, it's often noted that um, that these these 
gene expression changes are happening in um, not just the hippocampus, but also in the frontal cortex. So, um, so this is one way in which epigenetic changes in gene expression, like DNA methylation, can affect cognitive function, right? In this case, um, you know, directly um, affecting how we consolidate like long-term memories. Um, and then um, an, a second example is just as we age, um, research has shown that there's a phenomenon of this epigenetic assimilation and tissue dedifferentiation. Um, so the idea is that as when we go from birth and uh, we go through adolescence and young adulthood, um, it's really the job of the brain to become specialized, right? Um, you want specialized uh, cells and uh, brain regions to, um, to move towards these uh, different cognitive functions that we need uh, throughout the life. Um, but we've seen in research though, that as we get into older age, um, it kind of backtracks, it goes into the opposite direction. So the idea is that um, the, the unique epigenetic profiles become less unique and more similar to each other. And tissue, um, instead of becoming um, different and specialized, becomes um, less differentiated and, and less specialized. Um, the idea is that these phenomena happen in normal aging, which are fine, um, but it's been seen in Alzheimer's disease that this epigenetic change is taken to the nth degree, to an even higher degree. Um, so, um, so there is a component of epigenetic um, uh, changes related to um, then developing Alzheimer's later in life. All right, so um, some of the key takeaways, and I, and I see um, we're at 102 now, so I, I apologize for that, but um, some of the key takeaways um, for this talk is that the strongest evidence-based nutritional recommendations for delaying cognitive decline um, would be to adhere to a diet that mirrors either the Mediterranean or the MIND diet. Um, and even though we talked about all of these kind of uh, kind of doom and gloom uh, genetic and epigenetic um, influences that are important for understanding cognitive aging, um, understand that their impact accounts for a much lower percent um, than modifiable lifestyle factors like our diet, exercise, and microbiome health. Um, so there are definitely ways in which um, you can contribute to uh, moving into um, a healthy aging um, trajectory um, instead of one of, um, of cognitive decline. Uh, so I have um, here a list of um, some resources that you might be interested in, um, whether that's looking at particular vitamins and minerals and how they affect your health. Um, I have some um, uh, links to some of the diets that we talked about. So in particular, uh, the MIND diet. Um, this Dietary Guidelines for Americans is a nice um, a pamphlet that also talks about how um, nutrition affects um, maybe medications that you're taking. Because um, as we know that as we get older, um, there is the tendency of um, having to take certain medications and you want to know what those interactions might be. Um, and then there's a nice Scientific American article um, looking at personalized nutrition and DNA based diets that you might want to um, check out. Um, so just to give a little plug for next week, we have exercise and mental health talk coming up um, by um, Emily. So um, tune in for that for sure. Um, and that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for your attention and attending. All right, Mikhail, I've got a few questions that I want you to address if that's okay. You got a few more minutes with us. All right. Okay, so one of them, um, kind of going back to some of these slides, are when discussing that DNA methylation and methyl donors, you mentioned um, protein-restricted diet. What did you mean by that, and how much per day? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, yes. Um, so the idea, um, so I got that from, so I have the, if you're, um, 
whoever asked the question, if you're interested, there is a paper that I cited um, here at the bottom. And the idea is that, um, I believe what they were getting at is that uh, when you have a protein restricted diet, the body finds different ways <laughs> um, to um, get the nutrients that they need. So just like with um, so, for example, the ketogenic diet, right? Um, you move from a body that um, relies on glucose to a body that relies on ketones as a source of energy, right? Um, and so I believe what the writers were trying to get at is that um, a protein-restricted diet might move metabolism in a way um, to um, maybe rely more on these methyl donors to get things done. Um, but I think that's what they were talking about. Sure. And while you're on that slide too, you had a question saying, are all these processes within the same system? Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. They can all be happening at the same time in different regions of the brain. Um, the body takes um, multiple different pathways to, to get what it needs to get done. But yes, all these can happen um, all at the same time in, in different places. So yes. Sure. And this one's kind of kind of off the subject of this, but how do you find out your genotype? Oh yeah. Um, so I, I think for now, really the only way to do that is to either participate in a research study where they agree to give that to you, which um, which I don't believe they normally do, or you know participating in one of these um, like at home gene kits. Um, that specifically state that this is the information that they're going to give you. So like I said, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Ancestry.com and 23andMe and, and companies like that um, will give you that kind of information. Um, and hopefully they're giving you some kind of, I believe, and you can also, to be honest, I, I forget this, there's, there's a whole like you know, a profession of genetic counselors <laughs> that can, you know, guide you and, and talk to you about, you know, um, you know, what your genotype is, what kind of implication it has for either reproduction or whether, um, you know, um, diseases or things that you might incur later in life. So like Huntington's, right, has a strong genetic component. Um, and you may or may not want to know if you have the gene related to Huntington's disorder, right? Um, and if you go to a genetic counselor, that's something that they can kind of like help you and talk you, talk, kind of talk you through, right? So, um, so there are definitely um, services that you could take advantage of. You just need to check them out and see if they, you know, give you the information, you know, the particular genes that you're looking for. Sure. And this one, they're asking for a little bit more clarity. I mean, staying on this slide here, is, is it recommended to limit protein? Yet we, meat and seafood is needed for nutrients like zinc. Right. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable making a recommendation um, like that. Um, I think I would stick to... Um, uh, what do we what do we talk about our diets? I think I would stick to these diets, <laughs> right? Um, where they don't necessarily limit the proteins, but they suggest like where you should get your proteins. Um, so for a Mediterranean diet, they're suggesting that you eat fish and seafood often. Um, and um, even with the mind, they're saying you should eat you know fish at least once a week, poultry at least twice a week. So. Um, I think that's a great question to take to your doctor, especially, you know, considering that there are other ramifications for um, changing, um, you know, um, the makeup of your diet and, and what that might do to your, um, your current health status. Sure, and I want to kind of give you one of the last questions here to wrap it up, and it was one of our first questions, but are supplements like Prevagen helpful for maintaining normalcy? Prevagen? Um, supplements. Yeah, yeah I, um, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I stay away from those supplements. <laughs> Um, just because I, I would just do your, I would say do your research, you know, um, do your research. Um, there are definitely some supplements that I know that are out there that, 
um, say that they support brain health because they have B vitamins in it and it has selenium. It's almost like that question that I answered at the very beginning. It's like, why isn't there a pill that fixes everything? There are lots of reasons why there's not a pill that fixes everything. So if you see a pill that says it fixes everything, <laughs> <laughs> then um, then you should be weary, right? Um, and um, and you should you should definitely do your research. I know for sure there's some um, um, some of those uh, supplements will have maybe some of the research that they use to support um, to support the claims, but a lot of them don't. So if you don't see clear evidence of where they support the claims that they're making on those supplement bottles, um, then I would um, I would be weary, and I would focus on um, I would focus on you know um, a holistic view of how you can affect your um, um, your health. So that's diet, that's exercise, that's getting regular checkups um, with your doctor. Um, and I think that's the best way to go for sure. Alrighty. Oh yeah, yeah. I have I have a message. Yeah, Prevagen has actually had to walk back some of their claims, according to the FDA, making them um, be more uh, transparent about what it can actually do. This is kind of a fun question. Um, somebody asked, is all red wine valued the same in so far as brain health? And how about pink wine? Ah, I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, no, I think the focus on red wine um, are the, um, I believe they're the polyphenols that are in it. And so I believe the darker, the better. Um, that's why in the mind diet, it says that if you don't drink alcohol, um, you know, so I would be drinking grape juice then. Um, so they, they talk about drinking um, purple uh, grape juice of about the same amount. So this, so for the mind diet, they're suggesting about five ounces um, a day. So, so it's really, you know, the, the, a lot of these chemicals are in the coloring, right? Um, so just like when we talk about um, lutein and carotene, like you're getting them a lot from, you know, these darkly colored vegetables um, and, and fruits. So I would, I would go probably darker is better. All right, I think we've addressed them all. Um, I would highly recommend everyone checking out that chat box. I know Chelsea's put the evaluation in there that we'd really appreciate if you'd fill out for us as well as the link to the summer self-care series as well and information and material on that page. All righty, thanks. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you very much, ladies. Great job today. Thank you for everybody who were, were able to stick around. Um, great Q&A at the end. Um, if you could fill out our evaluation, it does help us shape um, the feedback helps our speakers as well as shape our future sessions. So if you could take a moment, it's a quick survey. We do appreciate everything and have a great week. Again, hopefully you can join us next week.